Hello, everyone. Welcome to Future Cities Lab podcast. Here in Singapore, I'm your host, Thandi. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Future Cities Lab podcast. Here in Singapore, I'm your host, Thandi. Today, I want to begin with a story. This is Rabia's story. Rabia is married with three children and pregnant with her fourth. Her husband is a construction worker, but he was recently laid off due to market slump. Rabia holds two jobs as staff in a small food stall in the morning and a worker in a manufacturing company in the afternoon. Her bosses at the company offered her either a ride on the company shuttle bus or a stipend for public transport instead. Now, there are so many things running through Rabia's mind. School fees for her first and second ones, milk and diaper for the little one, food for the family, money to buy clean water for cooking, drinking, her husband's cigarette expenses, the cost of medical checkup for her pregnancy. The last one can wait, but she still needs money for the rest. She chooses to take the stipend instead she starts taking public transport to work. Two transfers and the extra walk, she's often late. It could be longer since the drivers keep changing the route. But the worst is the last bit of walking home. Tonight, she's very late and a bit scared. It's so quiet and eerie and her friends told her about women getting attacked on the street. Why don't they fix the street lights? Last week, Rabia heard that there is a plan for a community meeting at the sub-district office asking for feedback. Maybe she could raise this issue there? But how? She wasn't even invited. They must also do something about the mosquitoes while they're working on those lights. With the number of cases of dengue lately, she cannot afford another expense. Maybe her friend knows how she can get an invitation. In all probability, her concerns will go unheard. With the mood her husband has been in since the layoff, she cannot expect him to help. It's already 11 p.m. when she arrives home. Her husband is fuming. She came too late to prepare dinner. He's hungry. Worse, he doesn't have any money for his cigarettes. He blames her for not managing their finances properly and for being late. He has decided. The eldest one should drop out of school and help out with the finances. Rabia cannot allow that. She stands firm. Tensions rise, the fight escalates, and Rabia's husband, in an aggravated state, physically violates her. Rabia is not a real person. But bits of her story are. My guests today are Dr. Devi Sari Tunas and Dr. Akino Tahir who investigated how gender sensitivity can be improved in urban planning in Bandung, Indonesia. Rabia is a personification of all the stories that emerged out of the interviews they did with several women-focused organizations. Welcome, Sari. Thank you. Welcome, Thank Akino. You for having you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you for joining us. So can you give us some background about this project? What was your motivation for conducting these interviews in Bandung? We were tasked to work with Bandung City in Indonesia to mainstream gender in urban planning by the Asian Development Bank as a part of their ongoing Future Cities, Future Women initiative. But you might ask then, uh, what is gender mainstreaming, right? Well, basically it means making sure that both genders' needs are being accounted for in the process of planning. Gender mainstreaming has been a significant part of urban strategies in many cities around the world as it's specifically aligned with the Sustainable Development Goal number 5 on gender equity. However, the understanding of how gender mainstreaming can be done on the city level is still quite limited among the government agencies as well as the citizens. Therefore, the first step that we took is to try to understand the gender-related challenges on the ground, and this is the reason why we spoke with a number of women organizations in Bandung. Sorry, I understand the value of what you're saying, and I'm an urban designer myself, and I would like to believe that urban planning has some kind of agency, what you're talking about, but I'm skeptical. 
is that really effective or does it have any significance? Because when I hear Rabia's story, I feel, how can I, as an urban planner, make any difference in this very complex socioeconomic web that she is trapped in? Well, Tanvi, you are right to be skeptical. I, I don't blame you for that. Uh, but, well, gender-related problems such as those faced by Rabia is a deep-rooted socioeconomic problem. So it cannot be solved by simply changing the design of her built environment. Nevertheless, urban planning can be used as an approach to improve her situation and her quality of life. Um, women and men, they experience their built environment differently as they have different roles in their life and poor quality of built environment whereby they live in determine the quality of one's experience and productivity and it is especially worse when one is poor and disabled. In this project, we propose to employ maps as a framework M-A-P-S, which are the four dimensions of gender mainstreaming, which stands for mobility, accessibility, participation, safety, and security. Now, Tanfi, let me explain a little bit about the dimensions, this maps dimension that Sari mentioned about. So in terms of mobility, for example, effective, reliable, and affordable transportation systems and services help women to navigate the city in living their lives with multiple roles. Their poor commute experience may impact the quality of life and their productivity. So as a planner, we could plan, for example, walkable neighborhood or well-distributed and affordable public transportation systems across all areas in the city. So for Rabia, for example, it would make her evening commute maybe a little easier. In terms of accessibility, there is a limited consideration and prioritization of women's need for public facilities such as health centers, clinics, or training centers, and so on, and also basic services, for example, clean water or separated toilet for men and women, and other things. But despite the provision of such facilities and services, women still face difficulties in access because of social, economic, and cultural barriers, as well as poor planning. So as a planner, we could plan for better provision of these gender-related public facilities and services, especially in areas that have a high proportion of female-headed households. In terms of participation, well, women participation in public life, economic activities, and city planning processes remains limited in the city due to the factors that Akino already mentioned before and the lack of inclusive decision-making processes and opportunities for such participation often hinders personal development and renders women's aspiration unconsidered. Now, we don't want that, do we? Safety and security create conducive living conditions for women. The movement and activity patterns of women are often shaped by this sense of safety, for example, in the streets, in public transport, and in public spaces, and also by the sense of security, which means the absence of fear of criminal activities, harassment, and physical violation, if you remember the story about R Rabia earlier. And as a planner, what we could do is we could design a well-balanced land use composition based on the concept of polycentrality, and also plan for a well-located public facilities in proximity to residential areas. I can understand the MAPS framework, especially in the context of Rabia's story, if she had access to better mobility and she was invited to the participatory meeting for planning. But could you give me some more concrete examples of how urban planning has achieved that? You know, Tanfi, if you talk about examples, I would say that Vienna has been the top example of gender-sensitive design and planning for the last 30 years. And they have successfully adopted gender considerations in their urban planning, which include the planning of public facilities, public spaces, parks and housing and other things. Some concrete examples, for example, they have considered you know, gender-based mobility route in their street designs. They design a specific public housing which can accommodate working mothers who juggle various tasks. So, you know, we could say that life is a little easier for women to live in that city because the city accommodates their particular needs. Yeah, but Aquino, you know, however, well, Vienna is a different context, right? Vienna has a very different social, cultural, and economic background. And it's completely different from Indonesian cities and perhaps many other cities in Southeast Asia, right? Which tend to be more informally planned and quite patriarchal. And in this sense, we need to have a different approach. I wonder that when you're working in this context of Indonesia, are there any specific local challenges that you face? 
I would say maybe relatively poor understanding of gender sensitive urban planning and the perception that it is only women's problem. You know, Tanfi, when we talk about gender equality, it's actually about the equality of women and men in having these so-called domestic roles and non-domestic roles. And domestic roles are traditionally assigned to women and vice versa, non-domestic roles to men, which is perhaps why people equate gender roles with sexes, you know, with being male or being female. But we live in a world where these traditionally assigned roles cannot work anymore, but, but the society still thinks so. For example, if a woman works outside, she still has to do all the things that she has to do at home. But rarely does the same thought applies for men. You know, if a man works outside, it's okay for him to rest at home. Now, unfortunately, that's what the reality is for most people. So at home, you know, gender equality means both the men and the women can share both these domestic and non-domestic roles equally. These different roles brings about different needs and challenges, right? So when you have multiple roles that you have to juggle, you have to do more things and you have to visit more places as well to meet more people in the same amount of time as what other people have. Now, I think it's very normal for people to see women to be very busy doing all these roles and also to see men focusing only at work and help their wives at home. So it was quite challenging to discuss about gender because it's sort of trying to change what is normal for people. We face these difficulties a lot when we talk to people, even to people that we thought would understand what gender roles mean, you know, and discussing the mainstreaming of gender in planning is like a few more steps ahead. So it takes a long process to get to that point. I think this would be the main challenge. It sounds like a very tough task, especially in the context that you're working in. You've also collected a lot of data through fieldwork. How did you analyze this data? How did you make sense of it? Well, uh, that's uh, quite a challenge for us. Uh, Bandung, like many other cities in Indonesia, they have a rich inventory of spatial data, which normally include census data, thematic data, and many of them are gender disaggregated and many of them are not. And these data tend to be underanalyzed in any case. And the challenge for us is to not only analyze it meaningfully, but also to make sense of it. What does it tell us? You know, what kind of problem... Uh, that it it says to us. So we put the data on Earthscape to help us to analyze it. So Earthscape is a special data platform which was developed in-house in FCL, whereby we can overlay several data sets to demarcate areas in the city that might be problematic for women. For example, areas with bad provision of gender-related basic facilities or areas with higher concentration of low-income single mothers and as well as areas with high incidence of dengue fever among the women population. By visualizing this data, it helps us to show the problems in a more effective manner with the city agencies. And this way, they know what are the priorities areas and what kind of strategies need to be devised. Uh, At the same time, by doing such official analysis, hence highlighting the poor data quality locally, We could also show the city that they still have to improve their data collection processes, which later could also be useful for other purposes for the city. My final question to both of you is, what is your vision for the future city with regards to gender mainstreaming in urban planning? So, Akino, you want to start first? Okay, sure. So, um, Tanfi, what we did in Bandung is one of the first steps towards a better gender-sensitive planning in the city. We hope the city would continue and take further steps to improve their capacity to do so and to be able to make use of good data, to make good analysis that will enable good decision making. ADB is interested to expand the project to two other cities in Indonesia, which is a good news and hopefully it will go through. And of course, we would love to scale up the project to many other cities in Indonesia and in Southeast Asia if there is an opportunity to do so in the future. And perhaps one day we would be able to showcase our own Vienna in the region that can serve as a good example of city with gender sensitive design and planning. I would also add that through this kind of project, we hope to be able to carry on these conversations about gender roles, about gender equality to men and women, whom we'll meet along the way, many, many more people. We want to share our stories. And because it's one thing to understand about it, but it's another thing to be able to influence what other thinks about it. I think that's the most important thing. 
and to be able to encourage people to take action, to voice out their concerns, and to participate more actively, and how we plan our city so that is a good city for everybody. Both your vision sounds so inspiring, so reassuring. Uh, can I share my personal vision? I believe that in the future city, the projects such as yours should become redundant, and inclusivity for all should be a starting point and not an afterthought. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah totally. Absolutely, yeah. So with that, I want to thank you for your time. This has been very enlightening. Thanks, Sari. It's thank been an honor. Thank you, Tanfi. Thank you, Tanfi, as well.